Well, we're in this series, I Believe, Help Me With My Unbelief. Last week we talked about I Believe I'm Saved. We looked at the things in our life that will be true if we're saved. We looked at the assurance of our salvation that it can't be taken away. Today we're going to look at the next stop, I Believe I'm Sanctified. I Believe I'm Sanctified. And so I want to define sanctified. It's in your notes. Before I define sanctified, I want to go back to salvation. I want to say something I think I said last week. And it's going to help us make the transition. So when we say, I'm saved, uh, that can mean a number of things. And that may sound surprising to you. It can mean a number of things that all mean the same thing. So I can say, I am saved. That means my sins have been forgiven. The penalty has been paid. I have, I have eternity in heaven to look forward to. I'm part of the family of God. I am saved. I look back at a moment in time, a time in my life, when I surrendered to Jesus Christ, asked forgiveness of my sins, and I was saved. So I am saved. It is also correct as a Christian to say I am being saved. I am in the process of being saved. My salvation didn't stop at the moment I was forgiven. It continues on, and that means something different. It, it means that the effect of sin is lessening in my life. We still live in a world of sin. We still struggle with sin. We still do right and wrong. And left to our own devices, we will always do more wrong than right. With the Holy Spirit in us and with God's help, we learn to sin less. We never become sinless, but we learn to sin less. So I am saved from the penalty of sin. I'm being saved from the effect of sin. And one day I will be saved. And that sounds like a contradiction, but it's also true because one day I will be saved from the presence of sin. One day I will be with Jesus in heaven. There will be no sin to deal with, and I will be saved from the presence of sin. I will be concentrating on other things that God has prepared for me in heaven. So I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. All are correct uses of the term. So in sanctification... We look at it similarly. I am sanctified, I am being sanctified, and I will be sanctified. So let's look at the notes. Let's, let's define sanctified. Just gave you six things. These are all off the internet from various sites trying to, trying to find a, a good definition. I just decided to use a bunch of them. So number one, sanctify, to sanctify is to set apart as. To set apart as or declare holy. So to set apart as holy or declare holy. Now when we're saved, we are set apart. God has said you, you once were dead, now you're alive. You once were bound for hell, now you're bound for heaven. You once were unforgiven, now you're forgiven. I'm giving you my righteousness, I'm giving you my family name. I'm setting you apart. You will now live differently because you are different. I will help you in that process. So he sets us apart. He declares us holy. He says, you, you are now holy in my sight. Number two, uh, to sanctify means to make legitimate by religious sanction. It's just different words meaning the same thing, to make legitimate. Uh, I'm now a legitimate child of God because I have been sanctified. Number three, to free from sin or to purify. And so we can see that in, in all three stages. I, I am free from sin. I'm being freed from sin. And one day I will be completely freed from sin. Number four, it means to set something apart for special use. So when God sets me apart, makes me a part of his family, forgives me, uh, declares me holy, I, I'm setting apart. He has a plan for me. He said, now that, now that you're mine, I have something for you to do. I have a life for you to live. I have people for you to impact. You, you're, not just, you're not just there holding up space, breathing air. I have something for you. I'm set apart for special use. To sanctify means to make someone holy. So God sanctifies us. God makes us holy. Number six, it's a verb, which means to set apart, to declare positionally holy, to change. These all kind of say the same thing. There's a lot of repeat in there. Uh, number six is a verb. So I am sanctified, I'm being sanctified, and I will be sanctified. Okay, I, I am set apart, I'm being more set apart. One day I'll be completely set apart. 
So sanctified, a, a different form of the word. Uh, sanctify was a verb. Sanctified is an adjective. An adjective describes someone or something. So it is an adjective used to describe someone who is saved. So if someone says, I'm sanctified, they should be telling you they're saved. They said, my sins are forgiven, I'm sanctified. That, that language is crossover. You'll read in the Bible, someone's described as sanctified. We can draw the conclusion that they're a saved person, their sins are forgiven. It is also used to describe our final position in heaven. One day in heaven, I will be completely made holy, completely set apart. I will have a purpose in heaven. It's not, it's, it's, I was about to say it's not just clouds and singing. It's, it's really not clouds and singing at all, unless you happen to be in the choir. And I probably, that won't be the only thing you do. Uh, we're going to have jobs. We're going to have purpose. We're going to be growing and learning still, I'm sure. And, and we have a final position in heaven where we're set apart for God's will. And then sanctification, often described as a process, it's also a verb describing what God is doing in a believer's life. So we are being sanctified. We, we are in the process of growing, in the process of learning, in the process of becoming who God wants us to be. So sanctification is, is a past, present, and future thing. So that's defining the word. So when I say sanctify, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm referring to. Now I just want to I want to go through a lot of scripture. And I just I just basically cherry pick scripture that talks about sanctification, uses a word or describes it. And we're going to go through these one at a time fairly quickly. We're going to we're going to gain what we can from the scripture. We'll do a little application and then next week we're going to finish this. It's going to be a two week thing here. So we'll start with John 17, 17. In your notes it says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Well, context is always important. So I have John 17, 17 open in my Bible. And both pages are almost completely red. R-E-D red. So in this Bible, that means these are words of Jesus. I look back to see what he's doing. And I find that he's praying for his disciples. So in the prayer that he's praying for his disciples, he says to God the Father, sanctify them, set them apart, grow them up, change them, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus says to the Father, your word is truth. Where do we find God's word? Well, right here. We find it in scripture. Where did they find it? Well, they found it in the Old Testament. That was the scripture they had. They also found it in Jesus. Remember, Jesus was often called the Word. In, in, in uh, John, 1 John, he's actually called the Word. You, the Word, the Word made flesh, dwelt among us. Might be regular John. I can't remember right now. So there you go. I'm human, right? <laughs> he calls him the Word. So, so not only is Jesus the revealed Word of God, the Scriptures are the revealed Word of God. And Jesus prays that... that that God the Father would sanctify them, change them, grow them up, call them out, give them, give them responsibility, give them purpose, uh, do what you're going to do in their life, but do it by the truth. Do it by the word. Your word is truth. So the gospel is part of the word. All the instructions are part of the word. All the promises are part of the word. We are saved or are sanctified through the gospel. We are being sanctified through all the instructions given in God's word. And we will be sanctified. We'll be completely changed in heaven one day. And we know that based on the promises. So the, the word of God is a major source of truth. Truth is the commodity that helps us become sanctified, helps us change. That's not all that's at work, but that's a huge part of what's at work. The next one, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. I want to stop there. I want to make a couple points. May God himself. So who's in charge of sanctification? God is. Don't think you're in charge of this. You weren't in charge of your own salvation. You didn't do anything to earn it. It was a gift. All you did was accept it. You didn't come along and say, okay, God, I, I got the plans now. I'm going to save myself. God saved you. Okay, you're, you're not any more in charge of sanctification than you were salvation. It, it's God's 
work in us. It's God doing his work. You do have a role just in, as in salvation you accepted the gift. In sanctification you can, you can accept it. You can move ahead. You can move along. You can help in the process, but it's God who does the work. So may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. There's the goal. It's not half sanctification. It's not outward sanctification only. It's not inward sanctification only. It's through and through. From top to bottom, from front to back, from left to right. Everything you are and everything you will become, may God sanctify you. May he call you, change you. May he grow you up. It says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. That's what it'll look like, blameless, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the end game. How long, did the, how long does this last? How long will we be working on this? Right up to the end. When, when the rapture takes place or, or I die and I go to be in God's presence, he will be working on this. He will be growing me, changing me for the goal of blamelessness, where, where no one can even make an accusation against me. And he'll work on that right up to the end. Continuing on, it says, the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. It's a guarantee. I hope you get this. This is very freeing. If you are saved, God will change your life. He will work on you to grow you. He will help you understand his goals, his motives, his way of thinking. He'll help you understand his word. He'll give you a purpose and a future. He'll, he'll, the Holy Spirit will indwell you. He will not leave you hanging. He will not leave you alone. He will not leave you to figure it out yourself. He will help you. It is his job to change you, his job to grow you. And I would much rather God was on the job than me. I'm a little lazy. I think I know everything the first time. And sometimes I'm stubborn. So it's good that God's on the job and not me, right? You would much rather have God working on you than me working on you. All right, just trust me on that. You would also much rather have God working on you than you working on you. So this is great news. God's in charge. The goal is blamelessness. He's not going to quit until we're in his presence. And he's the one that does it. Romans 15, 16, the next one. He gave me the priestly duty of becoming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God. So this is Paul talking. And Paul says, God gave me the duty of bringing the gospel to the Gentiles so that they could become acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Set apart by the Holy Spirit, saved by the Holy Spirit. So now we have another clue. Just really one thing I want to draw out of this verse. The Holy Spirit is, is the main part of God who's in the processing. God the Father is in charge of it. Jesus' words are part of it. But the Holy Spirit living inside of us, he's the driving force. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us understand Scripture. The Holy Spirit that helps guide our conscience. The Holy Spirit that, that, that prompts us and leads us. Helps us in our decision making. So that's good news. The Holy Spirit that lives inside every believer is involved in this process. First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Okay, this is Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, and he doesn't say, Fred, it's God's will that you be sanctified. Or Susan, it's God's will that you be sanctified. He says, All of you. All, all of you in the church, all of you Thessalonians in the church, it's God's will that you be sanctified. And if it's God's will for everyone in that church, we can jump to the conclusion that it's God's will for everyone in our church, no matter what church we belong to. So it is God's will, it is what God wants, that you should be sanctified. And then he describes what sanctification looks like, what, what, the, what the result's going to be. That you should avoid sexual immorality, sexual sin. That each of you should learn to control your own body, self-control, in a way that's holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the pagans. Um, you know, that's selfishness, greed, um, envy. Okay, pagans who do not know God. And that in this manner, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Okay, so our list is avoid sexual immorality, have self-control, uh, don't chase after passionate lust, and um, don't take advantage of a brother or sister. That's kind of the, the, just the nutshell, what it looks like. Then it says, the Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, Christians who commit those sins, as we told you and warned you before. 
For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. There's the description of sanctification. Blameless in one passage, described as a holy life in this passage. Therefore, anyone who rejects this, inst this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very one who gives you his Holy Spirit. So we have, it's God's will. Here's a, a description that the Thessalonians would identify with. These are the things they struggled with. And he said the goal is a holy life. So our sanctification should result in a holy life. More holy, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Turn your page over, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. This is Paul in another letter writing to the church in Philippi. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. He says, I appreciate your involvement. I appreciate what you're doing. He says, I always thank God for you. Verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So it is, it is God who began the work. Remember, you didn't earn it. You didn't plan it. You didn't execute it. God began the work. God said, hey, I have, I have salvation for you, forgiveness of sins. We accept it. We don't, we don't do the sanctification. He began that too. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Carry it on, that's progress over time. That's process. So our Christian life is a process. It's growth over time. We should literally be able to remember back 10 years ago, if you've been saved that long, and say, look how I've changed in the last 10 years. If you've been saved for 20, 30, 40 years, you should be able to look back over all those years and say, look how I've changed. If you've been saved for 20, 30, 40 years, you should also be able to look back and say, look how I've changed in the last 10 years. Change is always going on. It's never complete. And it says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God is going to keep working until you're in his presence. And then the work is going to look different. I don't think we, we don't just exist in bliss in heaven. We have responsibilities. We have things to do. It's going to be joyful and wonderful. But he's, he's working on us until we're in his presence. And it says he will carry it on to completion. He's going to get the job done. He's going to get the job done. Okay? The scary thing about him going to get the job done is the more I resist, the harder he has to work. Right? The more I fight it, the harder he has to work. Think of your own children. When you're trying to teach them a lesson, they don't want to learn. The more they fight the lesson, the harder you have to work. And probably the more painful it's going to get in one way or the other. Loss of responsibility, spanking, whatever the case may be. Well, if we don't want to learn what God's teaching us, then he'll keep working. He'll keep doing more. It'll get harder and harder until we learn, until we agree and obey. So 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what will be has not yet been made known. What will be? What will be is that final element. What will be, what, what I am in heaven, has not yet made, been made known. I really like this because it tells me that whatever's going to be happening in heaven is better than I can imagine. It's better than the small things we've been told. Okay, we've been told about rewards. We've been told about some of the architecture. We've been told about the longevity. We've been told about the, the sun and, and some of this kind of stuff, the, the new heaven on the new earth. We've been told a lot of stuff. But he says, what will be has not yet been made known. Like there's a lot of stuff that's going to be a thing in heaven that we, ha that we haven't been told. There's a lot to go. There's, there's a lot more to go. The closer we get now, the better off we're going to be in our present life. He says, but we know when Christ appears, we shall be like him. There's a clue. We'll be like him. For he shall see him, at, we shall see him as he is. So what's the end going to look like? We don't know yet. It's going to be better than anything along the way. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Yes, we do. We understand that. Sinners don't get to go to heaven. Forgiven sinners do, but unforgiven don't. He says, don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, 
nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is Paul writing a letter to the church in Corinth. These were issues they were dealing with. Verse 11, and that is what some of you were. So important that we don't miss that phrase. That is what some of you were. So he's writing to believers in a church in Corinth, and he's saying, listen, sexually immoral won't go, idolaters won't go, adulterers won't go, homosexuals won't go, thieves won't go, greedy people won't go, drunkards won't go, slanderers won't go, swindlers won't go, which sounds like really bad news because everyone sitting in every seat in this room can identify with one or more or most of these things. And we have to actually kind of admit that, yeah, I, this is something I struggle with. And, and I certainly did before I say more than I do now. And then he says, and don't forget, that's who you were. That's who you were. Meaning you're changed. You're sanctified. You're forgiven. You were those things. You're not now because you've been set apart, because you've been made holy. So we have that first stage, that set apart stage. It's also there to remind us that others who are coming behind us aren't that different, if at all, than we are. They're not that different. They're coming in the room with sin that needs to be forgiven. We came in the room with sin that needed to be forgiven. Our sin was grievous before God. Their sin is grievous before God. It doesn't matter which thing on the list was me. When I'm on the list, I'm on the list. And that is what some of you were. But, one of the most important words in Scripture, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Your sins were washed away. You were sanctified, set apart for a purpose. You were justified, declared holy. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of our God. So we were certain things. We were changed at our salvation. And now we are different things, becoming more like Christ. That's sanctification. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Paul again is saying that Jesus came to earth to deal with our sin. He didn't have his own sin to deal with, so he dealt with our sin. So that in him we might be righteous. We don't have our own righteousness but we can have his. He'll take our sin away and give us righteousness. That's sanctification, being set aside, being declared holy. It's something we become. Okay, it's a, we become this in a moment of time and we become more of this over time. He took the sin on himself so that we could become, we could be changed, we could be sanctified, become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, as obedient children, okay, so as believers, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance before you were saved, but just as he called you, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. This is a very interesting command. Commanded to be holy. Holy means sinless. God is holy because God is sinless. He doesn't have sin around him. He can't touch sin. He can't cause sin. So God is holy. And he says, hey, everybody, you need to be holy because God is holy. Well, that's an incredible task that is impossible for us. So what's he saying? We need to, we need to think about this. Be holy because I am holy. Uh, well, we're declared holy at our salvation, so we have that. I am holy because God has declared me holy. So when God looks at me, he sees the holiness of Christ. So when it says be holy, you could say it like this. Act like you're saved. Act like you belong to God. Act like you've been forgiven. Act like you've been declared holy. Why? Because God is holy. If God saved you, act like you belong to the one who saved you. Act like you're devoted to him. Act like you owe everything to him. Act like he's the most important person in your life. Be holy because I am holy. Be holy in all you do. That we, we, see the, we see the act. We're declared holy. We see the process. We're trying to be holy. And eventually we will be holy. 
So conclusions, conclusions we want to draw today. Uh, a little bit of repeat, but I want to make this point clear. As a believer, I have been sanctified. As a believer, I have been sanctified. I have different words all meaning the same thing. I have been justified. I have, I, justice has been served. I've been justified. I've been saved. Saved from hell. Saved from the penalty of my sin. I've been forgiven. God no longer holds my sin against me. I've been cleansed. I've been washed. These are all words the Bible uses. So as a believer, I have been sanctified. Number two, as a follower of Christ, I am being sanctified. Remember last week we read that if you say without sin, you're a liar? None of us can say we don't sin, but we can say we're trying and working at sinning less. None of us will ever be sinless. So as a follower of Christ, I am being sanctified daily by the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm changing. It will be more and more evidenced over time. Number three, when I'm in heaven, I will be sanctified. I will be completely sanctified in the presence of God. How? I'll be transformed into the version of me, recreated by God. Our soul is recreated as salvation. We receive a new body when we come into his presence, completely unaffected by sin. I will be completely sanctified because sin will no longer have an effect on my life. I won't sin. I won't have to deal with other people's sin. It will not be an option. So I, am, I have been sanctified, I am being sanctified, and I will be sanctified. I was reading the notes this morning, and if you're paying attention, the next thing says, in other words, and I realized I said the exact same words. <laughs> so in other words, the exact same words still apply. I am sanctified, I'm being sanctified, and one day I'll be fully sanctified. Here's the application. Here's what I want you to go home with. Here's what I want you to understand. Again, I've already said this probably a dozen times. Don't miss this. I am always in process with God. I'm always in process. No one gets to walk through the door with the attitude of, here I am, people. What do you need to learn from me today? I don't get to walk in the door like that, and I'm the preacher. Okay, nobody gets to walk into that attitude. We have never arrived. We are never fully aware of everything God wants to do. We are never fully aware of everything Scripture teaches. We are never fully who God wants us to be until we are in his presence. I am always in process. He will not allow any one of his, of his own to become stagnant. He's not going to just let us lay there, not growing. Okay? God's patience is perhaps the scariest part. Let me explain that. God's patience is perhaps the scariest part because we know God's going to finish the job. We know he's going to finish the job. Here's what maybe we haven't said. He's very patient. If it takes 10 years, he'll take 10 years. If you need 15 or 20 hard lessons, he'll stick around for 15 or 20 hard lessons. He's very patient. He will get you where he needs you to be. If you say to God, I know what you want, but I'm not willing to do that. He'll say, well, I'll be right here waiting for you until you are. And between now and then, I'm going to give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to learn your lesson, to, to bow your knee, to, to, to obey my will. I'm just going to keep putting it before you. It's going to hurt sometimes. It's going to hurt a lot sometimes. And the longer it takes, it's probably going to hurt more. He's very patient, but he's going to get the job done. Worst case scenario is that you re refuse, 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 and refuse, and he says, I need this from you, I need this from you, I need this, I need you to grow, I need you to learn. And you say, no, I won't do it, I won't do it. Worst case scenario, he removes you from this earth. Because what do we do with children who won't listen and obey? We remove them from the situation. And if you truly belong to him, and you are so stubborn that you're going to be in charge, God will just bring you to where he is. You're going to miss out on all the rewards, blessings, and benefits of a life lived for Christ. You're going to enter the kingdom with a lack of reward and, and, and a lesser place, although a wonderful place. And he's just going to remove you. We don't want to get to that point for sure. We also don't want to argue with God for so long that we have to suffer so many consequences of our own actions. We want to, we want to go in the process. Here's the way I've described it before. It's kind of silly, but it makes sense. 
I can run along with God, skipping and singing, holding his hand. I can go wherever he wants to go. I can listen to him the whole way with a smile on my face and a song in my heart. And I can go where he needs me to go. Or I can be drug along like a kid throwing a fit. And I can get there the hard way. And you all know what I'm talking about. If you have kids, you've had one that would often decide the hard way is the best way. And, and, and they were going to become gravity-driven individuals when you needed them to go somewhere. And they were not going to cooperate. Their hand became slick and hard to hang on to. Their screams became loud. But as a parent, sometimes they need to go where they need to go. And they need to do what they need to do. And you will take on the task of getting them where they need to be. And getting them to do what they need to do. And it may be painful in the process. Sometimes it might involve a stern talking to. <laughs> but you're going to get them where they need to go. And that's kind of how God operates with us. It's often the picture of he's the parent, we're the child. So when God says, I need you to go here, we can go, okay, let's go. Thanks for going with me. Help me out along the way. Show me what to say and do. Let's go together. It'll be great. And we can get to the destination. Or we can scream and fight and and dig in our heels and throw a fit all along the way, but guess what? We're still going to get to the destination. So I propose that we grab hold of God's hands and we, and we go where he wants us to go with a song in our heart and a, and a skip in our step. I am always in process. God's patience is perhaps the scariest part of this. Number two, I will grow faster if I pursue change. If I pursue change rather than just accept it. I hope you're to the point where you realize you have to accept it. You have to accept the change. Change will happen. I hope that you're beyond that, that your sanctification has processed far enough that you're not just accepting it, but you're pursuing it. Which means I, I don't just attend church. I listen. I, I maybe go back and review some scriptures. I don't just endure the song service. I participate in the song service. I sing. I don't just pray for a, a list of things I want, I pray for others. I pray for God's will. I, I pray for his, his will to be accomplished. I, I don't just come to God on Sunday. I spend time with God several days of the week. I, I, I might give up this thing because I need that time to give to God in, in service or in, in, in personal growth. I'm going to listen to podcasts. I'm going to listen to Christian music. I'm going to do a devotional. I'm going to get involved in a small group. I'm going to come to a Bible study. I'm going to spend time with other Christians who point me in the right direction. I will grow faster if I pursue change. Here's a little truth that's not written down there. If you grow faster, you grow more. You're going to get farther along and you're going to get there sooner. So if you're saying to yourself, you know, I don't, I don't like this kind of mud I'm trudging through. I, I want to get to the solid ground. Then the more work you do, the faster you're going to get out of it. The, the, the sooner you're going to be on solid ground standing right beside Christ. And the farther I'm going to go, if you say, you know, when I'm 50 years old or when I'm 80 years old, I want to be that person that everyone looks at in the church and says, I want to be like them. You know, we all know one of those people. We all know that godly man or that godly woman. I used to describe a lady in the church I grew up with. I used to say, when she sits down to pray, the angels pull up chairs to listen. We all, you know, hopefully we want to be that one day. Well, let's get there sooner. Let's get there sooner. I will grow faster if I pursue the change. I'm always in process. So our statement here at the end, I believe in sanctification. I hope you believe in it. There's no other way to look at it. If you don't believe in sanctification after all the verses we've read and after all the things that's been said, if you don't believe in sanctification, I don't know what you could possibly believe in. It's so clear from God's word that we are in a growth process that he is in charge of and he will bring it to completion. I can help along the way. I can be excited about it. I can do everything I can to make it the best I can, but I am involved in this process. It started with my salvation and it will end when I'm face to face with God. I believe in sanctification. Here's, here's the part 
that is our, our, our next step. Help me embrace it. Help me embrace it. I believe in it. Help me embrace it. Help me to pursue it. Help me to be excited about the process. I believe in it. Help me embrace it. More and more, day by day. More and more, day by day. So as we have uh, started this little weird thing we do, it's going to be weird for a long time. When it's no longer weird, I'll stop saying it's weird. This is what we're going to do until it's normal, then it's not weird anymore. We're going to start our prayer together in unison out loud. This is going to be the closing prayer. I'm going to say, Dear Jesus, and you will immediately start in the words, I believe in sanctification. Help me embrace it more and more. Not a repeat after me thing like we did last week. That was just more weird. Okay, we're just going to say it. We're going to say it together all at once. And then I'm going to finish the prayer. So, so you're, you're, actually, you're actually, by saying this out loud, you're praying to God, I believe in sanctification. Help me to embrace it more and more, day by day. Okay, that's how we're going to start. So let's, let's pray. Dear Jesus, I believe in sanctification. Help me embrace it more and more, day by day. Well, Father, we do believe in sanctification. We believe in the process. Actually, we're super thankful for the process because we're not getting anywhere on our own. Our lives aren't going to get better because we try harder. We're, we're not strong enough. We're not, we don't have enough perseverance. We don't have enough knowledge. We don't, we don't even have the right motivations. But with you being saved, our sins are forgiven, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we are sanctified and then we begin this lifelong process of growth that you want to take us on. And you have goals for us. You have purposes for us that we need to find and discover along the way. So we believe in sanctification. Help us all to embrace it. Help us to welcome it. And help us to look for it more and more day by day. Father, I leave this in your hands. Holy Spirit, do your work. Thank you for everyone who's here today. And may you help us, especially this week, to kind of to kind of think about and grasp this concept. And next week, as we finish up this idea of sanctification, I, I ask that you just, just allow it to sink in more and more. In your son's name I pray. Amen.